Okay, so today I wanted to kind of catch back up with um, posting here on YouTube. And uh, it's been a while since I've uh, done a video journal or a tutorial of any kind, but I was um, getting kind of inspired by some of the other fellows out there doing some great posts. And uh, one thing I thought would be um, a great idea to do would be kind of an introduction to the large format camera. Because uh, a lot of you may have not even seen one of these before or uh, really understand how they work. And uh, it's quite different than a digital SLR uh, in that it is obviously fully manual. And uh, the other big caveat is you don't have an LCD screen on the back of this uh, beast in order to see uh, the shots you've taken. So um, it's kind of... Uh, it's it can be a little frustrating at times because you don't get to see your images right away. Uh, at the same time, it, it's quite rewarding um, because you go out there, you shoot something, you have an idea of what it's going to look like and you hope, and, uh, and then you get it back from the lab, you know, uh, two weeks later or so, and then you take a look at it and you say, wow, there, there's all that effort we put into uh, creating this image. And sometimes you say, oh crap, that looks like garbage. And uh, geez, I gotta, I gotta get back out there and shoot some more. But uh, at any rate, this is a Ebony 4x5 view camera, and um, the model is the SV45TE. And basically, you can see it's kind of a, a little flat box with um, a bunch of uh, well, locking, um, locking wheels here on the side. And uh, this is the way that it travels when it's packed in the pack. And I just kind of want to walk you through how I set it up and come, some of the stuff that's in my gear bag. So uh, we'll start by uh, setting it on the tripod, which is already done. Um, I purchased a little shoe um, that fits with the really right stuff ball head that I have here. This is the BH55, it's a great ball head. And this is the Agetso tripod. Um, but anyway, so you would affix the foot to the bottom of the camera and then you would set it up on the tripod as you would any other camera. And you kind of begin by, there's a little latch here that we'd open up. And I usually keep everything locked when it's traveling. So you'd want to unscrew all these rear locks here. And this is, I'll get into the different components of the camera in a minute, but these locks are for the rear standard. Uh, so once these have been loosened on both sides, then you can grab the strap and fold the camera open. And then the first thing you really notice is this accordion piece here called the bellows, which many of you are probably familiar with with, uh, with these cameras. And there it is from the side. So once that's up, there is uh, a little handy little piece that Ebony puts on here with some levels and it will give you a horizontal vertical level. You can see the mirror uh, right here, or maybe not, but there's a mirror here that allows you to see the actual levels on the top of the camera. So if you're below uh, the top of the camera, which often you are, you can take a look at this handy mirror and level it out. So that's where I usually start. Uh, I try to get the tripod head leveled before I put it down, but go ahead and level it out. And then the next thing that I do is I bring up the front standard of the camera. And it's very similar to the rear standard. It has the same locks. And drop it down to place, lock it off. There's a little marker that will tell you where to start for your start position, a good start position is. And then go ahead and lock the tilt. And there you have it. So the camera is now open and ready to receive a lens. Now the lenses do not travel on the camera itself. The lenses are interchangeable um, with most digital SLRs, same deal. And the lens actually sits on a lens board and the lens board mounts here at the front standard. This is the front standard. This is the rear standard. They both have a rise and a fall, which I'll show you in a bit. 
And basically what a view camera is, is it's a front and a rear standard, a lens, uh, a bellows, and then a focus plane, which is the ground glass right here. And this is the glass that you focus your image on. Your image is going to be upside down and backwards. So it's kind of, you've got to get in the mindset when you're composing um, to be able to look at that and, and know how to compose your image. Um, because it, at first it can be uh, a little a little confusing, a little frustrating trying to figure that out. You're not used to seeing that way. But that that's what happens when you don't have a mirror inside the camera. So the, the single lens reflex, the lens actually flips the image around and shoots it through a prism into the eyepiece that we look through. So that's what most of us are used to seeing. But in this case, they didn't have that. It's a very simple design. I mean, it's a box with a hole um, that has a lens affixed to it. And then uh, the capture medium goes in the back and that's it. It's very, very simple, but it will allow you to do a lot of um, great adjustments, camera movements, things that come in handy for uh, straightening up uh, vertical lines, uh, tilting towards your subject plane, um, distorting images, making them larger or smaller. Um, it, it, it's a very versatile system. So let's go ahead and grab a lens and mount it on here. And my lenses I keep in a lens wrap that uh, are from Calumet and you can see it's just a sort of a, a cloth wrap with uh, Velcro that wraps around itself and kind of keeps your lens protected inside. And then of course there's a rear and a front cap and I take those off. And then you'll see the lens is mounted on a lens board. Um, I'm going to stop down this light just a bit. Okay, so the lens is comprised of a front element here, a rear element here, and then the shutter system, which is actually in the middle, and it kind of pancakes together. So the front element screws on to the shutter, the rear element screws on, and then they affix to this lens board. And all your settings are here on your lens. So you have your aperture settings right here for your f-stops. This, this uh, is a 120 millimeter Super Simar, uh, Simar um, by, um, by Schneider, which is a German company. And um, this is, 120 to 150 is kind of considered the normal lens for the 4x5 system. So this particular lens will go from f5.6 to f64. And that's achieved by a little dial here that you wind back and forth. And then the shutter is triggered via this little clip here on the side. And what you do is you would affix a shutter release cable release into that so you could trigger the shutter. And then to uh, actually cock the shutter to get it ready to fire, you would cock this little mechanism here. Once that's cocked, I've got this set to time. Now your settings, your, your uh, shutter speeds are all set on a dial here. Everything from a 500th of a second to a second. And then we have a bulb setting and then time. Generally, you're going to be shooting in the time setting because you're going to have an exposure that's going to be over a second. Uh, but occasionally um, you'll be shooting anywhere from uh, a quarter of a second, half second to a second. I've done that uh, before when I'm trying to stop water, um, when there's a wave or something. At any rate, once, once it's cocked and, and you have your cable release in, you can trigger the shutter. You can hear it click and then you would click it again and, and it would close. Uh, and there's also, for focusing, there is a way to open the shutter here. So this little latch will open and close the shutter. So that comes in handy, obviously, when you want to focus your subject. You need to see it. And when you do that, you're going to want to open your lens to its largest setting, which in this case is 5.6, so you get enough light on the ground glass in the back to see the image. 
Uh, so placing the lens on the camera, we'll just slide into a slot, tip forward, and there's a little locking mechanism here. The top slides forward and your lens is on. And there you go. So you can see you're basically set up and ready to shoot. Now you're gonna notice obviously with the ground glass on the back here and you've got a bright situation like this, you don't see much. You might see my hand kind of moving here, which I can, uh, but you're gonna need a, a, a dark cloth. And that's you know what you see with all the photographers with the cloth over the top of their head like this. Um, I've got an interesting one. I think I saw Nick Carver using this. So that's what prompted me to pick it up because I had another one I wasn't happy with that draped over the whole front of the camera. This is by Harrison and it's the Silver Classic Dark Cloth by Camera Essentials. They also make great changing tents, which um, in my film loading episode, I showed you that tent, which is awesome. But at any rate, this is great because it has got an elastic band that allows you to simply connect it to the back of the camera like so. If I had it locked, there we go. And now, once this is on, you can go inside the camera here and focus and make all your adjustments as you would. And it, it covers the back of the camera. It doesn't inhibit any of the functions, the, the, the rise and fall, the dials on the side. So it really gives you uh, access to all this without getting in the way. So I, I really like this. It doesn't blow around. It, it, it's a, a great piece to have. So I would definitely recommend this if you would like to shoot large format. And of course they come in different sizes for eight by 10 um, and larger systems. So a little bit about the camera movement. So rear standard, it was kind of moving around on me. I didn't have it locked into place, but this will give you the ability to have a rise and a fall. So you can see that the camera will rise and fall depending on your composition and what you're trying to achieve. And it will also give you a, a tilt. So you can tilt the rear standard. So this comes in handy if you're shooting maybe something like a tree and you want the tree to appear uh, vertical. You want the lines to, to maintain their vertical instead of uh, intersect together, which you see a lot. If you're shooting something, uh, that tend to get the vertical lines that come together. So you can correct for that by adjusting your front and rear standard and bring them a little bit more vertical, which is very handy. Uh, and it also has a tilt or a, a, a shift, I'm sorry, we call it a shift. And that allows you to angle the rear, the, the, the uh, rear standard at an angle. And that could come in handy if you're maybe shooting something and you want to show uh, the, the correct uh, uh, distortion that you would get from an image that may be like a wall or, or some rocks that are close to you and it's leading off on an angle and, and you can't quite, you want to capture that leading line where it's going so you don't want to shoot it straight on. So you may want to shoot down the rock wall or fence or whatever, but you might want to correct some of that distortion to make it appear larger or the right size or smaller in the plane so you can correct by the shift. And again, the front standard has the same, same abilities to rise and to fall like so. And also it has a tilt, so you could tilt it forward. And if you've got a subject like a rock or something in your foreground and you really wanna show an emphasis on the size of that, you can go ahead and tilt forward or some flowers in a field. You wanna show the, that perspective to be a little bit larger um, because it is your subjects so you're emphasizing. So you can go ahead and tilt down and that's gonna cause those flowers in there to look a little bit larger and, and lead off into the distance. And same thing by tilting back, you can control the, the 
the background and make that appear larger than your foreground. So if you have some large mountains you want to emphasize and make larger, you can go ahead and tilt back like so. So really versatile. Um, and and it, it does take quite a bit of time to set up, but it, it is very rewarding. And, and I had been frustrated many times with it. Sometimes when I get the film back, I say, gosh, what did I do? What the heck? I, I've been missing all these shots. If I had a digital camera, I would have had it all because I could have seen it. But there's just something about shooting film in large format that is, is very rewarding. And uh, it seems to be a movement of a lot of folks going back to it. And hopefully that's the case because I want to, I'd like to see the, the films continue to be available. So what else can I show you? Um, obviously, well, here's, here's the uh, cable release. And the cable release, like I said, will screw into the front here. And once your shot is composed, you obviously want to close your shutter, uh, set your aperture, um, do another preview through it, uh, especially if you're using grad filters, which uh, really comes in handy. And go ahead and cock your shutter. And then you would place your film holder here in the back. Um, I should probably grab one of those to show you. But the film holder would go here in the back of the camera and it would slide under the ground glass like this. And then once that's in there, you would release the dark slide and then trip your shutter and do your count and then close your shutter, replace the dark slide, pull out the film holder, flip it over, and then you could take another shot. Uh, you can also change the orientation. So we have right now what we would call landscape with the four by five. And to switch this around, there's a couple uh, latches here up at the top that would slide out. And this whole rear mechanism will come off and you rotate it and then set it back into the little trays, close that. And now you're in portrait mode. So very simple to go ahead and change that. You don't have to cock your camera, uh, very handy. Um, so this is, the 4x5 system. Now, I also shoot 120, 120 millimeter film, which is medium format. And uh, I have a system from, uh, I think it's Senhow, that uh, allows you to have a panoramic 617 back, 6x17 centimeter back that would go on the rear of this camera. And with that, I can use 120 millimeter film to shoot a contiguous panoramic image instead of doing like a panel stitch that you would do in digital. So I use that uh, as well because you can get some really cool images with that. So to use it, um, this is like a grap lock system they call it. I would pop these out and they just, they're little locks that spring loaded, that lock on here to hold your ground glass on. Very important that you always make sure this is locked on the back of the camera. And when you take it off, use a lot of care with it because um, there are two pieces here to this ground glass. There is a, a grid that you'll see in the front and in the back is a Fresnel lens. It's two parts. Very expensive to replace these, a couple hundred bucks. And if you're out shooting somewhere and you drop and break this, uh, you're SOL. You can't see your image to focus it. So if you're out backpacking, you know, miles uh, out in the mountains in the woods somewhere, you drop and break this, your trip's over. Uh, but anyway, I'll show you the 617 back real quick here. And this is something that I've been promising for a while from my trip last summer up to the Porcupine Mountains that I was going to do. Uh, so here we go. This is the ground glass system for the 617 back. And you'll notice it's a little further recessed. So um, some of your wider lenses may not focus uh, and you may not be able to use them. I, I read that you're able to use, focus a 90 millimeter lens. I haven't been able to do it. I've bought a recessed lens board and I've gone through about three or four of those trying different ones to get it to work correctly. And I was able to get one to focus. I think it was recessed like 20 millimeters or so. And the only problem with that is, is you're so tightly focused. This, this is how you would focus your 
lens. These are, these are your focus controls here. So you're so tightly focused that the front standard is basically in the rear standard like this. And you got no movement whatsoever, um, no camera movement whatsoever. So it's very limiting. So I've just decided to shoot with uh, my 120 millimeter lens because I have no problem focusing that and I can still get some movement. But this is basically how you focus. You use these knobs to draw in or push away the front standard from the rear standard. And this is the front standard focus. This is the rear standard focus. It depends on what you're doing. If you're shooting something like telephoto uh, with like a 210 or something like that, you're going to need to focus quite a bit further out like so. But generally with most landscape photography, you're going to be using a normal lens or a wide angle like the 90 or something. And that's going to draw your plane of focus much closer to your rear standard. So here is uh, the ground glass for the 617. And same deal, I would put over my focus cloth. Um, there's markers in here because you can actually shoot 617, 6x12, or 6x9. And they're all marked off conveniently. When you're shooting uh, 617 with 120 film, you're going to get four exposures. And that's it, because it's basically using uh, three of, of the exposures off of a normal 120 roll to comprise of that panoramic shot uh, that you would normally be shooting on medium format would be one. So I would go ahead and affix this. I would focus, set up put a grad filter in, do anything I need to do. Then I would take it off. And then I would affix the film holder. And incidentally, the model number on this is SH617, the art pano, panorama, the art pano, uh, by Senhao, made in China, go figure. Senhao Professional Camera Company LTD, and it will affix the same way. It will lock in. You're going to want to lock your rear, um, your rear lock here. This is where the 120 film goes on the inside. Uh, there is a take up and a distribution reel, and you just flip this little cartridge over. Um, as you put in new film, um, so it's a roll of film. The roll of film will pull across. You'll tuck the leader in to the take-up side. You'll advance it to where it says start, and then you'll go ahead and affix this rear plate cover to the back. And then to advance, your advance numbers are here for 617. You're set to exposure number 3, number 6, number 9, and number 12. And you do so by looking through uh, the little hole here and, and advancing to those numbers. Once you do that, you're really locked and loaded. You're shooting the same way you would be doing, uh, you know, your large format four by five. You would um, cock your shutter, and when you're ready to take, make your exposure, you're going to pull out this dark slide here. Uh, same thing you would do on a film holder. I'll have to grab one. It's behind my backdrop to show you. Uh, you would make your exposure. You would put your dark slide back in, and then you would advance the film. And now you've got uh, a, a really nice pano. Um, don't have a sheet of film laying around to show you, but it it, it it's a really uh, it's a really nice way to create some really cool stuff. Um, and in this way, you don't have to go out, run out, and buy a six seventeen uh, format camera because they're very expensive. Uh, um, Fuji made one, uh, the G GSX or the GX. Um, 617 and um, and Linhoff makes one as well which is very nice but they're very expensive you could get into a kit for seven thousand dollars for a camera like that um, this camera here was about 2300 I believe the back was 700 and of course your lenses so now you've got two systems in one basically it can be a little bit limiting um, in terms of, of some of the lenses you're able to use with it, but, um, you know, back up if you, if you need more, more room to shoot. So that's that system. And uh, 
what else? Obviously, because it is a uh, manual camera, there are no meter settings. So you're gonna need a light meter. Uh, I'd recommend the Pentex digital spot meter. Seems to be quite popular in the field. Very reliable, battery operated. So always make sure you have a spare battery with you when you're out shooting, because if this goes dead, you're in trouble. So you can't meter. Um, You'd set your ASA or your ISO speed up here at the top. Uh, generally, when I'm shooting, I'm shooting ASA 50 for Fuji Velvia 50 or 100 for 100 and then uh, Ektar. Um, and then, you know, you set your dial here. Depending on the aperture, you use a depth of field calculator. I've got an app in my phone. I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it's great for uh, factoring your depth of field. And then uh, based upon the depth of field and your desired result, it will give you a meter setting. Um, I found, I'll see if I can find the link to it, but there was um, a link that I found for a printable um, zone card that I affixed here to the top of the, it's kind of hard to see it and I'd have to focus it, but your zone, your zone um, card that I fixed to the top of my meter here so I know uh, what my uh, five stops of range here are gonna be between um, zone three and then zone five is set in the center so I'll meet it for zone five and then zone seven where I'm going to have some highlight detail still retained and then going beyond that um, with Velvia you know slide film you really start to blow out and you don't get um, really anything you get a clear sheet of film so that that isn't always desirable so that's kind of a brief introduction really to the uh, large format camera and in a medium format back and that's kind of what I wanted to do here was just use this to catapult um, myself into creating some more videos again um, give you a look at the system that I use and um, and hopefully sparks sparks some some interest and uh, some passion to maybe get into shooting large format uh, because it, it is very rewarding. It's a lot of fun. You know, you're not the guy out there uh, or the gal out there shooting, you know, 3,000 pictures on a SD card with a, you know, Canon 5D Mark whatever or a Nikon D8000 or the new Sony. I mean, digital is great and it's, it's come leaps and bounds. Um, and, and again, there are a lot of things that you can do with digital that you can't do with, uh, with film. But there's just something about it. It's very rewarding. The images, when you get them back, you look at them, they just have a, a realness, a real worldly quality to them, an analog feel, feel and look to them. You look at them through a loop on the light table and it's just amazing. It's, it's almost like you'd reach out and grab that scene and, and pull it in front of you and you're looking at it in a fishbowl or something. It just It's amazing to look at those sh those slides um, and then you can you know send them out to uh, uh, someone to have them scanned a professional drum scan made and you can print these images you know six to eight feet um, wide and, and just get some remarkable detail still inherent in them which you would need uh, some some software uh, algorithm programs um, like perfect resize or something to do with digital but it, it, it's all about what you want to achieve um, out there in the field, what, what you're really into, and um, it's a lot of fun. So I think I've rambled on enough here. I'm going to uh, sign off, but thank you for watching, and uh, hopefully this year I'll be able to post some more videos. Um, we've moved uh, from downstate Michigan to um, the Leelanau Peninsula in Michigan, and uh, Leelanau Peninsula is home to the world famous Sleeping Bear Dunes. Um, so there's a lot out here to shoot and that was one of the goals uh, for me was to move to an area where I could just get in my car and drive 10 minutes and, and be in an amazing, amazing landscape and just continue to shoot more. Uh, so look for more hopefully in the future and um, until then I hope you have a wonderful day and get out and shoot some more. Thanks.